There is a golden rule of roof cavities. So it's something that we all learn the first time that we enter into a roof cavity. Only step on the beams. I had a friend who learnt this the hard way. We were having a guy's weekend and we needed to run some cables through the ceiling, so we did it in the fairest way possible. We sent the youngest of us. It was his first time going up into the roof cavity, so he said, all you have to do is hold on to this cable, take it through to Lucas's house and plug it into the modem, but step only on the beams. So we sent him up the ladder, we sent him into the roof cavity, we were talking to him, it was going great, we were feeding the cable through, and all of a sudden we see we hear, whoa, crash, ah! Running into Lucas's house, this is the sight that we saw. He is okay. But the life hack that we learned from that is always check what you stand on in the roof. And he had trodden on the rafters and the beams. The problem was this one wasn't in the greatest condition and it splintered beneath his feet. Tonight we are continuing our journey through the book of Romans. And this is a beautiful book. I love the book of Romans because it is full of these amazing deep truths, these promises that we can hold on to, that we can cling to, these things that I go back to time and time again to just remind me of who God is and the way that he sees us, and what we can hold on to. And today I'm looking at quite a large passage. It's 39 verses. It's Romans 2.12 to Romans 3.20. 39 verses. This is a massive passage. And there are so many things that I want to say about it. There are so many things that I could say about it. But tonight I want to just kind of narrow it down and look at just one thread, one idea that runs throughout this whole passage. And it comes back to this question of, what are you standing on? What is it that you are putting your trust in? What is it that you are hoping in that is your foundation? And, you know, there is a Sunday school answer that comes with this of Jesus, and that's correct. And this is a question that I'm sure you've heard asked time and time again, and that's okay. Because the thing is, as we go through life, there are things that look like they're stable, there are things that look like they are steady, there are things that look like they are going to hold our weight, like a rafter and a ceiling. But sometimes when we stand on them, it crumbles beneath our feet and we fall. And see, Paul is writing this letter of Romans. It is a letter of conflict resolution. We've looked at that in the last couple of weeks. We have the Jewish Christians and the Gentile believers. And Paul is trying to bring these two different parties together. He's trying to give them a solid foundation in which they share. Last week, Gavin unpacked how Paul was helping to puff up the Jewish Christians' pride as they heard and listened to how awful the Gentiles were, only for the rug to be pulled out from under their feet, for their pride to be exploded as Paul pointed out that they are just the same, that they are doing the same things. And here in this passage, Paul is continuing that idea. He is challenging their idea of superiority. And he's pointing out that they're not actually that different from the Gentile Christians. And so Paul is challenging the believers in Rome with this question. What is it that you are standing on? So let's jump into our passage with verses 12 to 16. And it says, All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, 
even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them, and at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. Now, I'm just wondering, as you look at that, who feels the need to read it a second, third, fourth, or maybe even fifth time? Because I completely understand. It is a full-on passage. There is so much in there, and there are so many things. But one of the big things that Paul is challenging and is looking at is the idea of the law. He is challenging something that is at the very core of the Jewish people's identity, uh, of their understanding of who they are. And in fact, in the passage today, in 39 verses, the law is referenced over 20 times. So it's kind of something important. In the book of Romans, it is referenced over 70 times. I could get uh, the actual figures, but that was a rabbit hole that I decided not to go down this week. But when we talk about the law, we are talking about something that is at the very core of what it means to be a Jew, at the very core of their identity. Because the law is something that was given to the Jewish people by God. It was something that helped to define them as a nation, as a people. It was something that helped to separate them, set them apart from the people around them. But more than that, the law was there to reveal who God is. It helped, the law helped the people of Israel to understand his heart, to know that God cared for those who were less fortunate, to care for those who were on the outside, to care for those who needed support. The law was there to show them what is good and what is bad. And from a young age, Kids in a Jewish household grew up hearing the law, being taught the law, hearing the law respected and revered. It was a core idea of who they were as Jews. But there's something in this passage, in verse 13, that I want to highlight. Paul says, For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Here, Paul is highlighting two contrasts. The first one, those who hear the law who are righteous. Or another way of putting that could be who think they are righteous, contrasted with those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. There's this idea about who is righteous and who is not, that Paul is contrasting. But the other contrast that is there is those who hear the law and those who obey the law. He's challenging this idea of, is it enough to just know about something or do I have to do something with that knowledge? So he's challenging this mindset that was in the Jewish Christians of, am I trusting in my knowledge of the law? Am I trusting that I'm going to be saved just because I have knowledge about God. Because the Jewish Christian believers, they were so confident. They had been given the law. They had been set apart. They were God's chosen people. They had this law that revealed who God was to them. And in fact, even Jesus affirmed that the law was important. But they'd also started to fall into a bit of a trap. Just because we have the law, that's all we need. And Paul continues in verses 17 to 23, and he continues to kind of unpack this idea. You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that you shouldn't commit adultery, do you commit adultery? We hear that and we think, well, no. Duh. We don't want to be hypocrites. We don't want to be doing one thing and believing another. And he's, he's, Paul is challenging this idea that it's not enough to just hold on to something. We have to let knowledge and understanding change us. 
We have to let knowledge that we gain affect our actions. I encountered this firsthand this week. I was walking my dog on Wednesday. And I haven't been out into the Crown land for a little while because it's hot and I'm being lazy. So I'm like, no, I need to get back into some of my good habits. So my dog and I, we just climbed into some of the Crown land near our place. And my dog was loving it. He was chasing the kangaroos and he started to come back towards me. And all of a sudden, he veered towards this open patch of ground ahead of us. He started kind of pouring at the ground and moving forward and jumping back and barking. And I'm like, hmm, I think I know what's here. And I walked up a little bit closer and sure enough, there was my dog and there was the lovely head of a snake. I'm sure attached to the rest of a snake's body. I just wasn't getting close enough to see it. All of a sudden, my world has changed. My reality has changed because I have gone from the fact that there is theoretical knowledge that snakes exist in Central Australia in the wild to practical reality. There is a snake right in front of me. I had, to, I had a choice. I could choose to go, you know what, I have that knowledge now and I'm just going to continue on my way and I'm going to give the snake a wide berth and walk past it. Or I can let that knowledge inform my action. I turned around and I ran as fast as I could away from that and I am not going back to that area of crown land until the weather gets cooler. We can't trust in just knowing something. Knowledge is meant to inform our action. And this, this idea of knowledge informing action, it's not new. If you read the Old Testament prophets, they regularly were telling the people of Israel, you've got the law, so why don't you do it? Jesus regularly said to the people, you know the law, so why aren't you acting on it? Why aren't you living it? Why aren't you doing it? It is there to change you. It's not a new idea. And I'm sure it's something that we've all heard before, and yet I wonder, is this something that we do? Is this a mindset and a trap that we get caught in? Is this something that we try and stand on that we trust in only to have it collapse beneath us? Because I know that I can fall into this trap. There are times that I am reading the Bible and I can get so excited about the connections and the way that it all fits together. I can get so caught up in the fact that it is one unified story and it's great and I love it and I forget something really, really important about Scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Or Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I don't know about you, but something that I struggle with is sometimes I get so caught up in learning things about God that I forget that God's word is actually meant to equip me and train me for the way that I show Jesus' love to others. Sometimes I get so caught up in learning those cool little facts and quirks about the way that the Bible was put together or of the culture of the times and I forget that it's a tool that God uses to shape my heart and my character. Or maybe we can hear a great sermon, we can get fired up about it and we can go, yeah, that's awesome. And then we jump in the car and we go, Where am I going for lunch today? Where am I going for tea? And it drops out of our minds. I have a pastor friend of mine who is fond of saying when he preaches, if you never heard another sermon in your life, you've still got enough to work on. Because it's not enough to just hear it. We have to apply it. 
We can't just trust in knowing all these great facts about God. We've got to have a relationship with him. And see, Paul actually unpacks the damage of this kind of thinking and this trap in Romans 2.24. He says, as it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Paul is not pulling punches here. He is challenging the Jewish Christians at the very core of who they are. God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And it's, he's referencing Ezekiel 36, verse 22, and we're going to kind of come back to that a little bit later. But this same thing applies to us. When we allow ourselves to live lives where we are learning lots about God, but we're not actually applying it, we're not adding it to our lives, we're not implementing it, we're allowing God's name to be blasphemed. We're bringing dishonor to God's name because we represent him as Christians, just as Israel represented him in the Old Testament. And the point that Paul is trying to make here is this is serious business. But he doesn't stop there. See, Paul continues on with another way of, another trap that we can fall into. Verses 25 to 29 say, Circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, not is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Not only is Paul trying to make it difficult for somebody trying to read this part of the letter out to people, because you try saying circumcision that many times in a row, Paul is challenging another core identity marker for those Jewish Christians. Because circumcision is a sign of the promise from God. It is a sign of the covenant, covenant agreement that was given to the people of Israel by God all the way back in Abraham's time. It is this marker and this badge that says we are different because we are in a covenant with God. We are in this agreement with God. And it's this symbol that they share with the other Jews. It is a symbol that unites them, that shows that they belong. When you talk about Judaism and circumcision, you can't separate the two. They go hand in hand. And that's why it was brought up again and again in the early church as they tried to wrestle with and understand how does circumcision relate to this new covenant that we have. But verse 27 there says, The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, who even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. Paul is challenging this idea that circumcision is something that should be held up and desired. It's something that should be held as an identity point. Because just like it's not enough to hear the law, but it's about obedience. Here Paul declares that those who are uncircumcised but who obey the law are better off and are going to condemn those who are circumcised but don't obey. Paul is challenging and just pointing out the challenges that the Jewish people had. And here he's pointing out that mindset of, am I trusting in circumcision? Am I trusting that it is enough for me to just belong to the club? Because this idea of circumcision, it united the Jewish people. It united the Jewish Christians. It was something that they shared. It was something that they used 
to show that they were different, that they were set apart, that they're special. Because it's a, literally a symbol of God's promise to the people. And yet, this trap is one that we can fall into as well. Sometimes we can fall into this trap of thinking if we know the right things to say, if we know how to speak the church lingo, if we know when to stand up, when to sit down, how to sing the right songs, if we can perform the rituals and fit in with the church crowd, we belong. That's all that's needed. We are saved because we fit in with the crowd. It's this trap of thinking that church is just about the actions, coming along singing, hearing, sharing a cuppa afterwards, making small talk that's sometimes a little bit awkward, maybe even serving, but that's all it is. This idea that if you have a printed name tag, you belong to the club and that's all you need. I have, I know of someone who actually had this mindset. For 30 years, he had sat in church thinking that because he could talk the talk, he belonged and that's all he needed. 30 years he sat there hearing sermons preached about Jesus. For 30 years he stood up and he sang worship songs with everybody else. For 30 years he hung around after the service, had a cuppa, made small talk. He joined in on church working bees. He helped out. 30 years belonging to the club, trusting that that was enough. Can you imagine... He died and went and stood before Jesus. And Jesus' response, I never knew you. That's challenging, isn't it? But what I love about God is God does amazing things. And I'm able to share that story with joy knowing that for 30 years, his wife prayed for him. For 30 years, his family prayed for him. And God changed his heart. God gave him a fresh heart and a new heart. And I saw him as he made a personal commitment to Jesus. As he understood, this is what faith is. It's not about belonging to the club, but it's about a relationship with Jesus. I got to see on video him getting baptised one Easter Sunday by his choice. I was in Fiji with his son and we were watching via video with tears in our eyes as we watched him get baptised because God had done a change. But I share that story to go, this mindset happens and it's right here in churches all the time. We can trust that just because we can fit in with the crowd, that's enough. But it's not. Because Romans 2, 28 to 29 says, A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Our faith is not a matter of belonging to the club, but it's about relationship with God. It is about the inward change that God does in us. And so Paul has been spending this section of the letter knocking down these ideas and challenges to the faith of the Jewish Christians. And he's been showing them that the Gentiles are just as good as them. 
He's been leveling out the playing field so that they are all starting from the same foundation. But what I really love is this whole passage, he has also been unpacking what is the truth that we can stand on. And he's been doing this through a practice called stringing pearls. And the idea of stringing pearls is it is a Jewish teaching practice. And the idea is you reference scripture in other areas. We've seen all through this passage that there is, as it is written, as it is written. But it's not just about referencing other scripture to go, hey, this has been said before. The people who are listening would know where those references would come from. But they wouldn't just know the references, they'd also know the wider story, the point of the wider passage, the wider context that was sitting around it. And we see a big example of this in Romans 3, 8 or 10 to 18. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Each of those different colours is a different reference, or even multiple references to different points of Scripture. And part of what he's doing here is, when you look at this on face value, you see the level playing field that he's making. We have all failed. We have all sinned. We've all stuffed up. We've all made mistakes. I'm no better than you. You're no better than me. We all need God. But then when you dive behind these passages, because we see this idea of stringing pearls as well in uh, chapter 3, verse 4, where Paul references David's cry to God in Psalm 51. This cry for forgiveness. And we see it in verse 24 of chapter 2 as well, where he talks about God's name being blasphemed among the nations, which comes from Ezekiel 36. And I want to use that passage to kind of unpack the theme that runs through all of these. Ezekiel 36, 22 to 27 says, Therefore say to the Israelites, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. This is that idea that uh, Paul has just unpacked in all those other verses, but it goes on. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. There is something beautiful in this passage. Because at the start, it is not about our efforts. It is not about what we do. It is not about our goodness or our faithfulness or anything because we've stuffed up. But in spite of that, God is going to sprinkle clean water on us and we will be clean. We don't do it, but God will do it. He is going to give us a new heart and put a new spirit in you. This links back to that bit on circumcision, that God is going to renew us and refresh us. He's going to remove our hearts of stone and give us a heart of flesh. And if you sit down and if you look at all the references that Paul does, the entire Psalms that he's referenced, you see that it is the same message again and again. We are unfaithful. 
We have stuffed up. We have failed. But God will save us. God will save us in spite of our actions. And so here is the key beautiful truth of this section of Romans, that God is the one who saves, that we trust in God, not our efforts. We trust in what he has done and what he is doing. We don't earn salvation on our own. Instead, it is a gift that comes from God. That is a message that is seen all throughout the book of Romans. It's not about how much knowledge about God we have. It's not about whether or not we belong to the club. It's not even about whether or not we are good. It is about God's faithfulness and his goodness and his character that loves us and changes us. We are able to stand strong because God in his goodness and his faithfulness chooses to lift us up. And this is the message that you see through all of the Old Testament references that Paul has. It is God who saves regardless. And do you know what? This is not a new truth. We've seen it's all throughout the Old Testament. This is most likely a truth that you have heard many, many times before. But it is one of those core, important, beautiful truths that we need. Because this truth is what we can hold on to that removes the fear of disappointing God. It removes the fear and the worry that we are going to anger God. Because it speaks of his goodness and his faithfulness. It is the truth that removes our feelings of pride and superiority as we are reminded that I am the worst of sinners and I have failed. But God rescues me in that moment. It is the truth that frees us from a shame of not getting things right. Because it's all about God and his goodness. It is the truth that shows us, that demonstrates to us that God loves us, that we have an incredible worth It's not tied to what we do for God, but it's tied to how he sees us and how he loves us. A truth that gives us hope when we make mistakes or we fail. And so as I close today, I want to ask you, That question, what are you standing on? Are you trusting that you have enough knowledge about God that you can pass a test? Are you trusting that you can talk the talk enough to fit in and belong to the club? Or are you standing on the truth that it's not about your effort, that it is about God's goodness and his faithfulness that saves us. Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to just say thank you for Romans. Thank you for the challenges in it. Thank you for the richness of it. But God, thank you for these deep, deep, important truths within it. These truths that we can hold on to, that we can cling to. And Lord, as we seek to follow you, I know that there are times that we can 
tread on uneven ground, that we can tread on these parts of life that are not trustworthy, that won't hold our weight. We can start to rely on our knowledge. We can start to rely on belonging. Lord, when we do, help us to actually ask this question. Lord, help us to be reminded of the truth that it is all about you, your goodness, and your faithfulness. Lord, help us to cling to this truth always. To not just hear your word, but to obey. All these things we pray in your name. Amen.